Thanks everyone for coming and a big thank you for um, Valerio for giving us some time to talk about some of his work today. Um, yeah, so Valerio is from the School of Computer Science at the University of Nottingham and um, works a lot in sort of plant phenotyping. So we met at the, the Phenom UK workshop last year. Um, really ex some exciting stuff that I'm hoping you're going to talk about. Um, and yeah, so I'll, I'll let you get on. Can you hear me right? Yeah, yeah, of course, yeah. Finium UK has a, a, I mean, I will tell a story today, so Finium UK is also part of it, but because now I remember where I, where I saw you, because I said, I, I've seen you somewhere, but I couldn't relate where. All right, excellent, let's get this started. I see a lot of people already join us today. Um, can you confirm you can see my screen? Yep. Uh, excellent. Uh, let me see if I can uh, pop the chat. Excellent. I also have the chat at my disposal, so I can. So if anybody has, so wants to type something, I I can read it while I'm present. All right. So Fraser, thanks a lot for your invitation. Thanks a lot for having me here, and uh, thanks a lot for your introduction. As, uh, as Fraser said, I'm uh, Valerio, an assistant professor in uh, Nottingham, uh, the School of Computer Science. I still consider myself relatively new in Nottingham. I joined exactly 11 months ago. Uh, I would be a year in May. And uh, what I've done in um, basically with plant phenotyping, my work has always been focused on counting. So my PhD dissertation was on counting. And uh, and I'll tell you the story of how basically I developed certain you know methodologies from the very beginning thing, you know, to come to very more, let's say modern and advanced methodologies. So um, a quick introduction about myself. Um, I got my PhD formally in Italy in a, in a, in a research institute called IMT Luca. I stayed there a year, but then I stayed the rest of my PhD in Edinburgh, where I also did my PDRA uh, at the University of Edinburgh with uh, Saptaris. I became a lecturer in 2019 at the Edinburgh Napier University. It was a few months before the pandemic, so not a great point to you know to start and uh, as i said uh, nearly a year ago i also i basically moved to nottingham and uh, i'm an assistant professor in computer vision over here um basically um what uh, i've done it's i basically tried to synthesize with one slide um basically what i do is all about computer vision with uh, machine learning. Computer vision is, you know, we want to extract information from uh, images. In particular, I worked a lot on uh, plant images. So what is about image analysis in general? So we want to teach computers to extract useful information from images because we want to make certain predictions. Here we have a very, very, very simple example. We have a plan. I hope you can see my mouse cursor, which is going to help me to draw your attention. So here we we have basically an image of a plan, and this is what we see as human with our eyes. However, a computer doesn't see this. You see these kind of patterns because you say because what what a, a deep learning model does in the end is to extract information that in the end it will be able to relate it to a prediction. In this case, 14 leads. So we go from this representation and we want to get a prediction. In a nutshell, this is what image analysis is. And I also done all the written application in medical imaging. I also done, um, especially when I was in Napier, something related to natural language processing, but most of my work have been in 
computer vision, especially with plan. All right, I'm um, together with SOTOS, I'm also a member of BIOS. BIOS is a research group that SOTOS founded, and uh, they do a, a lot of things. So, of course, this slide, so what you see on this slide is what the group does, not what specifically I do. I basically mostly focus on data representation, and uh, but there are you know, certain people working on learning from simulations, basically synthetic data. And actually this slide with plants is mine. It's one of the work done during my, uh, I think, PhD, yes. Uh, many people working on causality and correlation. And, uh, and also there are people working on uh, privacy, data leakage, uh, value of data, and whatnot. So this is a, a slide that summarizes the broad uh, expertise of views. And uh, I position myself in one, although I also done a little bit of two. All right, and uh, the group is uh, mostly focused on medical imaging and, uh, and uh, plants, basically. All right, this is a very, uh, old slide that I keep presenting because uh, in one image it, it pretty well represents what we are interested on. So from uh, from uh, a plant in this case, this is an Arabidopsis. You want to have a piece of software that can um, extract information. This information can be whatever you need. It can be the the mask of the projected area, the a bounding box on the on the whole plant can be a bounding box of each leaf, or it can be a segmentation of each leaf, a plant center, it can be anything that you are interested on extracting from this kind of images. And of course, when biologists specifically plant biologists are running an experiments, they have also, you know, metadata, which uh, especially nowadays by leveraging, um, you know, large language model, for example, I, I assume that ev everybody here has had at least one direct experience with GPT, right? Now, uh, it, you know, now, uh, compared to when this slide was done, you can see it was done in 2016. I said it's an old slide, but I like it because it's still very relevant. This kind of textual information can be used in the loop. Uh, all right. Is a uh, plant image analysis challenging or it, it is still challenging? Well, um, I mean, there are certain problems that, from a computer vision perspective, that plants pose. So here there are a couple, so they are not all of them. I just summarize what I believe there are, you know, the more uh, pressing. And for sure we have size and shape variation because it leaves a constant change in shape and size. Uh, Imagine when a plant is uh, at a juvenile sta uh, uh, um, stage or in senescent stage, the variability, how, how much a plant grows is huge. Of course, we have the problem of occlusions. You know, leaves tend to always overlap to each other. We have a high interspecies variability, plants or leaves that are from the same species, but can be from, let's say, different mutants or different genotypes might have you know a different appearance and there is a, an example in the slide and uh, the last bit the last bullet point in this slide is uh, mostly related to a problem from a machine learning perspective which is basically there is a very limited amount of annotated data sets available now things are a little bit changing, but we might have more analytical data. That's true. Great. 
but don't uh, neglect the fact. So don't forget the fact that also AI and particular deep learning is making a lot of strides. So models are becoming uh, more and more robust, but as well, at the same time, they are becoming bigger and bigger. We will see later this with when I will introduce transformers. Uh, and the, at the rule of the thumb, very simple. The bigger the model is, the more that we need. Also because you want to account with all the variability you see, size, shape, occlusions, species, and whatnot. In particular, why I've been uh, focusing on leaf counting, uh, I, I think I will go very quick on the motivation here, because I think uh, this should be pretty obvious for most of you, if not all of you. I mean, Knowing the number of leaves is an important trait for the development stage of a plant. The question is uh, how we can teach a computer to perform this task automatically. Because uh, for us as a human, it's very easy to count leaves. We take a plant, we just go there, ta -ta -ta -ta, 12 leaves, excellent. Uh, great, for us it's very easy to do, but it's also you know, tedious, uh, time consuming, error, and also error from sometimes, right? And um, there are many ways how we can uh, teach a computer how to count leaves. Or let's say there are several approaches. There is a regression approach. The regression approach means that I have an image and the algorithm predicts a number. That's it, a, a, an integer number. 14, 12, 5, that's it. Detection, detection is basically uh, what I showed you before, to have a bounding box surrounding each leaf. And of course, counting the number of bounding box should provide you the number of, of leaves, right? And also segmentation, which is similar to detection, but not the same. Basically, each leaf is delineated. So you have a very nice delineation of, of the leaf. Of course, each approach has a pros and cons, uh, but these are the three major ways how you can tackle this problem. All right. Here we have a very quick example. Regression, you just have a number. In detection, you have a bounding box. In segmentation, you have each leaf delineated. Uh, I've never basically touched detection, but today I will focus on what I've done, which is basically regression and segmentation. All right. I'll try to keep the technical um, part of this of this talk uh, at the minimum, but I need to go a little bit technical. So, well, so as I said, for regression, we are interested on predicting the number. And uh, what this means is that we have the set of images, basically this set over here, and then we have the set of numbers. And what we want to learn is a mapping between the set of the images, which is typically we, we call this set the training set, huh? to the set of numbers, which basically we, we call this set of numbers in many ways. Uh, I don't know which terms you are used to know. Uh, I will try to use them all. These are called the target variable, annotations, labels, ground truth, there are many, many terms that people use, let's say, inter interchangeably. And we want to learn this mapping between the images and the numbers. This is what, what all regression is about. And uh, how you do that, you basically, you want to learn a function. Machine learning, in, a, in its very essence, at the very, 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 you know, 
lower level, it's all about learning a function. And uh, that's why it's, it's called machine learning, right? Because we want to learn this function that basically given an image, boom, it can give you back a number. Now, let's start from, you know, the beginning. And when I say the beginning, I mean like the beginning of my works in uh, leaf counting. So, the problem is that, um, in general, any machine learning approach you can use, it cannot work directly on this data, like on this image, because an image is basically done of, uh, you know, a matrix of numbers, actually three matrices of matrix, because you have um, RGB images, like so three channels, red, blue, and green, right? And uh, it can't work directly on this because it lacks discriminative power. There are, there's a lot of redund redundant information. There's also information you don't need. Let me explain what, I'm, what I say, like information we don't need. If we are counting the leaves, for sure we don't need pixels belonging to the, to the tray or to the, or whatever we consider background basically, right? Redundant in information. Um, if we need to learn a pattern of, um, you know, of the, of the, how do you call this? The petiole of the, um, of the leaf. Uh, unless of some specific variation, here I can see at least four of them. I mean, if I zoom in, we could have seen more, but from here, we, we can see at least four. Is it enough? Is it uh, so we need to learn from all of them or we just need to model one PTL for all? So there is a little bit of redundancy there. Then there, there could be other redundancies, but I will skip for the time being, unless somebody asks specifically in the in the chat. All right, so we have, let's say, a two stage approach. The first stage is we take the images and we extract some some representation and again for this representation there are at least two big terms image representation as i said or image features and uh, we have this function that i noted here with the greek letter psi so given an image provided to this function whatever this function is uh, we get a representation which we call z typically z is a vector if you see from uh, a linear algebra point of view is a vector. And then we have uh, another function, phi, that takes uh, the feature vector and provides you with a prediction, in this case, a number. And now I will tell you why this two-step approach, and be because this is part of the story that I will tell today. So this is the middle outline of what I came up now, eight years ago, 2016, um, it's a machine learning approach. As I said at the beginning of this section of, of my presentation, is uh, old fashioned. Back then, it was not all old fashioned, but now it is. And the imagine that there are four steps, but the first three steps are just to learn representation. So you see how important it is to learn a good representation from the images. And with this term, to learn a good representation, there have been, I don't know, not less than thousands of papers trying to find what is a good representation. It's uh, something that has, has not really been figured out. But what we could say is that let's find a representation that is good for our task. In this case, it's good to count leaves. That's it. So, as I said, the first three steps extract image representation. The last step is just to perform the counting. Um, the very first thing I, uh, I did 
is to rectify the image because I saw that Arabidopsis are, um, you know, rosette plants. Well, now it's clear to me that when I was at the very beginning, you know, I was not very used to, you know, this kind of plants. And uh, so they have this uh, radial distribution of leaves. So, and before I said, um, I mean, there are, you know, the petiole, right? It can be, it seems pretty much similar. It's a very, you know, it's a, something that is nearly rectangular and, um, you know, apart from some variation of the shape, it's more or less, you know, thin and long, right? And also the leaf blade, right? Okay, there are a lot of variations in terms of how they appear, right? But the fact that they are rotated, that might be a little bit misleading. So let's have as much, of course, as possible, um, all in the same plane. And I've done this using what's called the log polar representation. So basically I do a change of plane from an X, Y coordinate system to a theta rho uh, coordinate system. And uh, basically theta is calculated using this function and rho with this function. So basically theta is about the angle of each pixel with respect to a center or the center of the plan. And uh, rho is the, is the radius, basically how far is each pixel from the center. That's it. This is for, for me most important just to remove the effect of rotation in a plant. Then uh, the next thing I do is uh, I extract patches. But again, there is a lot of redundancy, right? And basically I was extracting patches only in spe on specific regions. Uh, basically regions where, uh, you know, the ratio between foreground and background was maximized because I didn't want to, to, to extract anything from this area, but just on areas where I had, uh, you know, things to extract in a sense, right? Then uh, what, I did, what I did is basically, okay, I have all these patches. Let's find, uh, let's find uh, um, some, let's say, common patterns. So what I did is to use a clustering algorithm. Uh, I used the uh, k-means, which is uh, very widely used till now, and basically to find whatever is common and to have something that I can relate to specific patterns identified in, a, in a plant images. I basically learned, uh, you know, 50, 50 groups, and for each of these 50 groups, you have uh, uh, what we call a central. It's basically a nine, um, is the average of all the patterns in that cluster. And you can see that certain patterns are, appear to be, you know, similar to a petiole, some others to certain, you know, parts of a blade or other specific patterns which uh, might be a little bit not clear to us, like this one. But this one, you see, it looks to be the, the pattern recognizing where, where the petiole, you know, meets the blade. And um, now that I have this, uh, you, you know, these centroids, what I do is like for each patches, I measure the distance of each of these centroid. And then I take an average of the distance for of each centroid because I have 50 of them. So for each patch, I get the distance of, of 50, you know, common patterns. Let's use this word. And then I take an average. Uh, which, which this average will give me a single vector, which basically represents my image. As I said, all of these three steps is just to extract a representation from my images. Once again, the vector I was telling you before, my representation vector, 
high trained uh, and simple regression model. In, in this case, was a uh, uh, sub uh, SVR, which is based on SVM, which stands for Subtle Vector Machine. And, uh, and because I had annotated images, I was basically learning a mapping from the vector to the number of leaves. So I was checking the time to see if I'm not going too slow. All right. Okay, how good was this model? Um, uh, to define how good they are, we need to come up with some pro proxy metrics, something that, you know, we can uh, quantitatively assess what is good or bad. I was using these uh, four matrices. So we have the difference in count, which is basically the average, sorry, is the, is the average, yes, of the difference between my prediction at the, at the label, absolute difference in count is the same, but it, the difference is taken in absolute value, the mean square error, and the percentage agreement. The percentage agreement is basically how many times I'm exactly predicting the number of leaves. Because uh, let's assume that the plant we see here in uh, A1, I'm not sure how many leaves it has, but let's assume it has 12 leaves. Um, and the algorithm predicts 11. It's still good enough. Huh? So that's what the other three medics do. But if we want to also measure how many times I'm exactly predicting 12, huh? that's what percentage of okay, does. I was testing on three data sets. Uh, Sorry, I should have gone here to introduce the data set. So A1 is a data set of uh, Arabidopsis thaliana, only called zero, like uh, the wild type basically. A2 is still Arabidopsis thaliana with uh, four more uh, genotypes, which I don't remember on top of my head, but there should be a slide later for that. And then tobacco leaves. So A3 is just tobacco plants. Um, I was comparing with uh, back then with this paper number one, which was released the year before, 2015. And uh, let's just focus on one metric. And uh, you can see that there is a drop on absolute count, uh, absolute count difference of uh, one leaf. Of course, the, you know, there is a, a little bit of spread with the, the standard deviation, but still there was a drop of one, um, one, one leaf on average, which was good. That's why uh, my approach won the leaf counting challenge in 2015, and everybody was happy then. Now, what we did then is uh, we took this approach and actually we want to do, you know, okay, we have this algorithm here, it's great, and now we want to do phenotyping. And uh, we did some, uh, you know, phenotypic analysis in, uh, in the data set A2, which had these genotypes, also the Columbia, CRT, I2, ADH1, PGM. Uh, I, I want to emphasize that I am a computer scientist and I just don't remember anymore what are the differences, but in 2017, I, I remember them. Um, so we, we tweaked a little bit the algorithm that I showed you so far to take into account the genotyping information. And um, on the top here, you see the, um, the ground truth. So here we have the average leaf count over time and the spread for each ge genotype. And, this the, and here you have the algorithm prediction. It, it's true that there is a, a spread, right? 
but the but yeah on average this plot follows the, the same you know trend here and if you are interested on certain development stages so we were using uh, this nomenclature from uh, another paper that was identifying these the stages like when the leaf has four leaves so when the plant has four leaves 10 14 and more than 15 uh, more than 14 and uh, again ground truth predictions apologies sorry um, there is of course a variation but these two plots they have many things in common in my opinion and uh, yeah it's working right or at least it was working um and before we move to deep learning let's see if anybody has any questions i don't know if there are any hands that are raised but if somebody has any questions it's better to you know stop here for a couple of minutes tap in the chat or feel free to unmute yourself I typically say to my students when I'm teaching online, I give you a couple of seconds to to type in the chat if you're typing. Um, yes, while we wait for that, I've got a, a quick one. Um, just go for it. what was the the decision behind not applying detection methods? Was it sort of model maturity thing? Because that's probably what I've done most more recently. But there are more sort of mature architectures for doing that. Was it just at the time there wasn't? That's a very good question. Very good question. The answer was uh, for us, uh, and when I say for us, uh, we, are, we are thinking about always from a computer vision perspective, right? Is that uh, back then in 2015, because it's true the paper was 2016, but I started my PhD 2015 when I worked on it, was that do Bound biologists need to have a bounding box to count leaves, or we can just predict the overall numbers. And the second thing is that uh, we didn't have data level for bounding boxes, so I was supposed to put manually. But but that was not the problem because if there was a need to have a detection, we would have done it. But I don't remember exactly when this presentation, but around slide 30, we'll, we, I'll get back to, to what you said. Yeah. More or less 30, 30-ish. <laughs> okay. So don't think there's anything in the chat. So yeah, feel free to just keep going. All right. So I've, um, I took the freedom to put some um, memes on the presentation just to break the attention and uh, in the hope that people get it's engaged um a little bit so from now it's uh, so from this slide onwards it will be about deep learning and uh, it's true that sbm does exactly what we want to do but deep learning that's fair and that's why is uh, is uh, everybody's so you know Everybody uses it nowadays, right? And why everybody wants to use it? Because if you saw three out of the four steps in the pipeline I showed you before were devoted to extract a suitable representation from images. But the problem is like, again, what is a suitable representation? What is a good representation? Yeah, when we know it, we'll tell you, but so far, we don't have a, 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 a general answer that makes everybody happy about it. So the, what deep learning does uh, is uh, you saw that there were four steps, right? Four steps, but I decided what those four steps are. I decided to make the long pole representation. I decided to extract patches 
and of course, when we extract patches, we we decide how big these patches are or should be, how small, uh, how many. So these are all decisions that I took because uh, I was applying decision based on the problem I want, I want to solve, right? I made those decisions. And of course, using a k-means to come up with some patterns, I decided that. So I decided how features were supposed to look like. Were they good for the task at hand? Well, it was working. But the question is like, can we do better? The answer is clearly yes, because deep learning were at the very, 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 you know, you know bottom. What it does is to extract fe features for the task, everything done end to end, and uh, we don't need, I don't need to tell it, you know, the feature should look like this, so do a key means or whatever. The process of feature extraction is done internally. Optimized for a specific task. In fact, if you want to make, um, you know, a parallelism, right? The first three blocks are all about feature extract, est extractor. And the last bit is the task head. I use this term because uh, if anybody has used as uh, seen the different paper, it just to relate the same terms, right? Feature extractor, task head. And uh, again, the feature extractor seems to be a big, a big chunk. But somebody can tell me maybe it's a big chunk just because in the past you had the three steps and you want to match, you know, the size of the figure. Yes and no, because still the feature structure is, uh, of course, it depends from model to model. It's always, let's say, at least 50% of the model, if not 90% of the model architecture. Oh, sorry, I pushed the two buttons at the same time. And an example is uh, on this work. Um, so here, we want to use deep learning. Of course, this is not the first uh, deep learning leaf counting um, project I did, uh, because there was one or two at least before, but this is different than the other. So I want to show you something different. What is the the peculiarity here? Why I decide to you know to show you this? Well, because I'm not counting leaves only on color, basically RGB images, but I'm also learning to count the leaves on near infrared and uh, effluorescence images. Why? We will see in a bit why, but the main, you know, information you should take from this slide here is that I'm learning to count the leaves in a multi-modal case. Of course, I'm using a different data set of the one I showed you before because back then those images were acquired with just colored images. So here I took a data set that has flow, uh, RGB images, near infrared, and fluorescence. Actually, there was also a fourth modality, depth, which I never used, too low quality to make something. And, uh, and basically here I have each of these orange boxes, which are called the modality branch. We'll see in a bit what the modality branch. This modality branch here is to extract features from RGB images. Here's to extract features from infrared, and the same thing, is to extract features from fluorescence. Each of these modality branches gives a vector 1024 um, numbers. Of course, uh, in computer science, uh, you know, we always like to give values power of two, always. And we fuse these three vectors together. So, we, so out, of the three, out of the three vectors, we take one. And uh, we don't do an average, but we do the max. So for each element from one to 1024, so we have three numbers. I take the maximum all the time. 
and then I learn the task over here. So A and B, feature extractor, actually, sorry, feature extractors, because we have three of them, and then we fish, we fuse them together. The last bit is the task head. Now somebody can ask me, what is this modality branch and how big it is? It's this big, it's a ResNet. And in particular, in particularly, we were using ResNet 101, and the 101 means it has 101 layers, which are a mixture of convolution layers, skip connections, max pooling, everything you, you know, you find in a, in a classical convolution neural net. So, and this modality branch here is basically copied three times for each of those, right? Now, why to learn from three modalities? The question was very simple. Can we improve the counting if I provide data from multiple modalities? And the answer is yes. Because uh, when I learn the same model with just RGB images, I get, you know, uh, let's focus uh, for sake of comparison on the mean square error, 0, 0 0.5. Fluorescence, 0 0.5. Near infrared, 0 0.3, nearly 4, 0 0.4. So individually, the model was not that bad. Of course, it's a different data set than the A1, A2, A3. So we cannot do a direct comparison with the numbers here, with the numbers before. But you will appreciate that the, you know, the mean square error is below one. Also, the difference in count is below one. No? But when we compare it, uh, when we combine everything together, the mean square error drops to 0 0.2. Let's say nearly 2, 0 0.17. And the, and the percentage agreement goes to let's say on average of 50, here we have a 70, to 88%. So by using multiple models at the same time, I can improve the lift counting performances. And we improve by a lot. And it's also more precise because 88 times over 100, which means uh, nearly nine times over 10, I'm exactly predicting the exact leaf counting, right? Okay, fine, excellent. Um, somebody can, uh, you know, argue said, okay, is there a practical need to have uh, three modalities? Well, all the, so that depends what you need to do. Imagine that you want to predict leaf counting around the clock, 24 hours. Of course, you will set your diurnal and nocturnal cycle. Let's say, I don't know, I'm just making a number, 12, 12. So 12 hours day, 12 hours night. And how do you measure the leaf counting overnight when literally lights are off? You can do it with a near infrared, right? And uh, so you can perform when uh, leaf counting 24 hours. That was for us a rational from a plant, plant science perspective, because till here, we are here I'm addressing a computer vision question. Can we improve the leaf counting with multiple modalities? Yes, we can. Why a biologist want to, you know, spend, let's say, resources, meaning money to have an infrared camera? Well, that depends if the need to assess the, the leaf counting around the clock. If you need, great, you can do it. Now we will go to counting via segmentation. But before I move there, any questions? If you, if you, if you have, otherwise I can go ahead. So I give you a few seconds to type in, in, in the chat anything. But before I move forward, I just want to pick up to what Fraser said before. As I said, 
never done directly, personally, so not directly. Detection, but segmentation. For the simple reason is that uh, back then we didn't have the data for segment for, for the detection, but nowadays a lot of people have the data set for segmentation. And in my opinion, segmentation conveys more, more information than detection. Because with the detection, you know the position. You can roughly say how big the leaf is, but not exactly how big the leaf is. But with segmentation, you know the position, you know the orientation, you know how big it is. So the segmentation conveys a lot of information. And of course, because it conveys a lot of information, you need a, a, a bigger model. Okay, I don't see anybody in the chat, so I will move forward. So why segmentation is better than counting? Well, because you can still count with segmentation, right? And uh, as, I, as I just said, it gives more information. And somebody could say, okay, you've done leaf counting. At a certain point, why do you do leaf segmentation? Because uh, in 2018, 2017, there were already data sets we, we could use to do leaf segmentation? Simple, simple answer is because people did it. But I'm just reporting here an example uh, regarding Eastern segmentation. But there were a lot of work around that. So other people were working on that. Um, okay, so given the, the way I started, this talk is that this is the story of what I've done for leaf counting. You would basically guess that at this point I will show you a work I've done in leaf counting. Oh, sorry, in leaf segmentation, right? Which is true. And then uh, why I did that? If people were working already on that, what did I do? Well. The answer is, uh, is not like what did it do, it, what changed? The AI technology changed because transformers were introduced. Of course, not the transformer in the slide, but these transformers, I'm skipping the details, how it, how it works behind the scene, but I will give you you know, the gist of what is important. So transformers are basically a type of deep learning introduced in 2017 on this paper called Attention is All You Need. What they proposed is, an, is a self-attention mechanism, which basically weighs the importance of different parts of the inputs, which are called token, during the processing. In the past, people were using recurrent neural network or LSTM, which is long short term memory networks. And in fact, this paper recurrent is the segmentation uses LSTM. Um, because they can do sequential, you know, processing. And in fact, what this paper would do is to segment at each iteration a different leaf, basically. But transformer does, doesn't do this. A transformer would basically perform a prediction at once. It doesn't do this sequential processing. Um, if you have ever used ChatGPT, a Gemini, you already should be familiar of the potential of transformers. Uh, maybe, I don't know how many of you know what GPT, like GPT means, means uh, generative pre-trained transformer. So the T is a part of what ChatGPT is, right? Um, and of course, this mechanism of using self-attention at the beginning found a lot of applications in uh, natural languages processing, 
a natural language, language generation because ChatGPT is a, is a, an NLG model generates natural language text. That's it. It's very powerful, exactly because it uses behind the scene transformers. Um, and of course, it's also powerful for one of the things I've said at the very beginning, because it's trained on a tremendously huge data set. That is also where the power is, right? Um, and the reason why people were using for text is, is because of, um, each word can be seen as a token. A token is basically a word that we use to mean that the problem is that also for text you need to do you need to extract a representation, right? So also for text you need to extract something that the machine can understand. The um, a transformer will never work on raw text as we give it to it, so it will go th through. A process of uh, extracting features, but people from NLP don't call in the way we do it. We just use a different term, but means the same thing. They basically extract an embedding from the text. It's, it's, it's the same thing. And the way they extract an embedding, they don't extract from the word we write, but from tokens. Um, just for sake of completeness, I say you might wonder why do extract. They extract this representation from token rather than from the raw text. There are many reasons for that. I just give you one, just to give you the 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 most important information to you know for me to keep working on on to to, to keep presenting this. Is because you can uh, write a word in many in many ways. You can write I don't know. Let's say the word. Uh, transformer, or you can write the word transformers, transforming, transformed. All of these they have the same stem but different declination. So, so this is what the tokenizer does. It takes the, the stem of the word, which is transformer, sorry, transform, and then you have all the variations: the s in the end, ed, ing form. And one knows the same process, the same idea can be applied on images. Instead of considering token as a, a part of the text, you consider a patch. A patch becomes what we call a visual token, and from each visual token, you extract features. And then people have come up with something called a VIP or visual transformer, which is the Computer visual counterpart of uh, other transformers used in NLP or NLG. So what we did here is we we took a visual transformer and we asked the following question. We take a visual transformer as is already pre-trained. We don't touch it. The question is, can we get Comparable performances of the, at least the state of the art, if not even better. Can we get at least comparable performance without touching the transformer model and just adapting it to our task, that is the seg leaf segmentation? The rationale why we don't want to. Um, we don't want to change the visual transformer is because um, it has been trained on uh, a huge data set. So we su we suppose that the feature it extracts are already very good. We don't want to change. We just want to adapt it to a specific task, which is leaf segmentation, because we want to answer here with this project uh, one simple question. Can we start thinking of having a foundation model for plants? What is a foundation model? A foundation model is a deep neural network trained on the 
a big variety of data and can be used, and because of that, can be used in a variety of contexts. Examples of foundation model, ChatGPT, Gemini, VIP. So the question is like, can we start thinking of, of having also a foundation model for plants? We train once, right? We train once, and then you can use for, let's say, any task, or at least most of the phenotyping tasks. Instead of for us to train, you know, a VAT with plant data, we just kept it pre-trained from another data set, a big data set. Uh, because the training a VAT requires a lot of computational power. And before, you know, endeavoring in using, you know, a large scale plant image, image data set, let's try with what we have. And then if we see that it works, we can then make it better with data set crafted for plants. I'll skip the quantitative, sorry, the quantitative results. And this is what we got. We had, we have four methods to, to do the, um, to do this, uh, sorry, to do this uh, um, adaptation. So one is called, sorry, one is called the Gothic tuning, and the other one is called LoRa. LoRa means uh, low rank, uh, now I don't remember what the S stands for. It's basically, I add a very tiny parameters just to adjust this to perform the task I want. For us, the decoder is simply the, you know, the segmentation net, right? That provides the segmentation of plants. So this is the ground truth. And uh, more or less, they, you can see all these four methods work pretty well on average. If you look at first glance, it works pretty well. But if you zoom in a little bit, you will see some issues. Here is missing, for, for instance, part of the PTO as well here. Here there is some bleeding. I don't know if you can see, but here there is a little bit of this light blue leaf over here. Um, here this is some uh, also leak. Uh, leakage over here. Keep in mind this is Dinolora. I mean, on average it works pretty well, but you, you know, it's not crafted for plants. We're just using something off the shelf and adapting for what we need. And uh, yeah, sorry, I was not uh, totally honest with you. Yes, I'm showing quantitative data uh, re results, of course. And um, and basically, even though in this example you, you could see Dino Lora was a little bit, you know, not the greatest, it's still the one that you know gets the some some good results. In uh, in uh, leaf counting. This is so. These are the metrics for uh, the quality of the segmentation. This is for the for the leaf counting. Apologies, sorry. This is the the apologies. Sorry, I'm I, I messed up. So let's go back. So this is the quality of the segmentation. This is the table for the quality of the of the leaf counting. That's why at the beginning I said keep in mind Dino Laura because it's the one that was providing the best leaf counting result. And it's not the greatest uh, for the for the segmentation. It's good for the leaf counting. The question here is, could be like, which one we need the most? Well, that depends on the application you want to apply it on, right? Because I've been, you know, speaking about leaf counting a lot, I would prefer these numbers. But of course, I need to provide also segmentation results because in the end, 
it was a, it, it's exactly what I'm doing. I'm segmenting. The counting is just a byproduct of just enumerating how many segmentations I have. Let me check the time. Oh, it's been an hour now. Um, okay. Now, uh, before I go ahead, um, any questions? Because now we will, uh, I will basically go to a different application of counting, which is not on on leave on leaves. So, if anybody has any questions so far, that would be great. Before uh, I give you some time to type in the chat, um, this is uh, basically applying a lot of the things I've said so far to a different project, basically to count cells or to count people. However, there is uh, an extra bit that I need to introduce. All right. So let's let me introduce you transfer learning. Transfer learning is basically I have an, a neural network. I already trained to do something. I want to transfer that knowledge to another data set. And typically you want to do it because of a pre-trained network has already certain knowledge that allows you to train it for your data set. With the, with the less uh, images, with less label data. And we already saw a few techniques already. Fine tuning, LoRa in the context of the, of the VAT I showed you before. And here I will show you, not exactly in details, of course, I will skip the technical details what we call it the, the domain adversarial training. The question is like, uh, if transfer learning is so easy, why don't everybody use it? Well, there's a problem of domain gap and uh, you know, maintaining performance across different domains is not easy. What is the domain gap? I introduced this. So in the context of plants, it means that it, you can have two data sets of Arabidopsis images, right? Here you have a data set, here I have another data set acquired from two different labs. By, yes, you can say it's still Arabidopsis, but because of the context changed, the way these images have been taken, the sensor, basically the camera, illumination, the background, many information has changed. A lot of things have changed. So we say that these two, you know, data sets with these two domain are characterized by domain shift. So which means that basically if you extract features from the source domain and you plot in, in, a, in a, 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 a two dimensional graph, that they will get clustered together. The target domain will, will be get also clustered together, but they will be far apart. This is because there are two different, basically, sets of images. And the question here is, can I, you know, learn here, how to count the leaves and transfer here? Sure. However, there are problems. And, uh, and this problem, became more exaggerated when we did this data set. So these images you see, I used a simulator that was already online to generate um, images of cell, synthetic images of cell. I just downloaded this code. And the reason why I generated these images of cell is because we had an hypothesis, we want to complement it. And this hypothesis, quote in quote, unfortunately, was true. What it means? Um, here you have the source data set. Again, these are cells. 
Um, and again, I chose these cells because I could control how many cells I could have on each data set, right? And the source data set ranges between uh, a and B. So imagine here we can have cells of, uh, so images of cell between 10 to 50 cells per image. And then I have a target data set that not only has a different appearance, so this means it has a domain gap, namely this, but also exhibits another gap. The range of cells is different. So here I said, let's say between 10 and 50, and here I said the dozen images on the target will range between 50 and 100. So you see there is a, there are two different ranges, right? There can be a little bit of overlap, but their range is different, right? Is this a problem? 100%. Because if we were using what the literature do to transfer from source to target, just to remove the domain gap, the network was not able to count up to the range of target data set. Because I always seen images between 10 and 50, they couldn't go beyond 50. And, uh, and as I said, we could prove this hypothesis by making, you know, a, a generated data set that we can control also, not only the visual appearance, but also the range of counting, right? How we can solve that? Well, the idea we had was uh, um, they have different ranges, but let's normalize between zero and one. So if you normalize between zero and one, you can basically say, okay, you learn to count anything between zero and one. And then we will see how we can fix it later. But when you do the transfer learning here, you basically can learn a general regression model that doesn't go between from A to B, but goes between C and one, which is equal to everybody. And uh, so this methodology is uh, similar to others that you can find in the literature. So the pre-training, basically you pre-train the feature extractor and the regression model. Then you do the adaptation where you, you want to train another feature extractor for the targeted data set. Uh, this is the, the feature extractor for the source data set. This is the regression model. This is basically this is here. This guy is here. These two models are not trained during adaptation. And uh, here, basically, I do the, I try to do this ad adaptation of basically say, make sure that the feature extract from one data set are the same the feature extract from the other data set. And here I basically make sure that the network doesn't learn uh, something weird. So basically doesn't learn to speed always zero or always 0 0.5, which means that it does not learn uh, a degenerate solution. This is, this is basically a regularization term. And then, the last bit is we take the model on the on the trade on the target, and we do a last bit of fine tuning. We just take a couple of images, like very few, like ten, on the target with actual count to restore the absolute counting. Because so far the network has learned, sorry, has learned to count between zero and one. And here, okay. What is an image with 0 0.9 cells? It does not make any sense. So you need a little bit of fine tuning with actual counting to restore the counting. And basically we evaluated it with uh, several methods. Again, it was working good. We have here some upper bound and lower bound. The upper bound is basically, I get the model trained on, uh, on the data set of blue cell and I test it on the data set of red cells. And you see the performance are very bad. The lower bound is like, I get the model and the trend directly on the red cell. This gives me lower bound. So let's see where we are in between. And this was our pre my previous work that was doing this with plants. And then ours here 
is uh, the model that I'm I'm presenting here. In one case, it was not doing it the greatest, but in the other case, it was doing it the greatest. In this case, we were only changing the the visual appearance, basically the domain gap. But here, we were changing the visual appearance, but also the range of counting. And that is where the model I propose you now works best to the one I proposed you before. Sorry, I didn't propose you before. I didn't show you that to you. I proposed before that in the couple of years before because it cannot compete when the the range of counting changes. And this is on on people basically. This is on on people. All right, we are almost done. It's ten past uh, three. As I said at the very beginning, nearly an hour ago, I'm part of Film UK. Film UK is uh, a 2.5, a 2.4 million funded project from UKRI, in particular uh, through BBSSC. We want to basically scope the need uh, of the community to have a distributed research infrastructure for phenotyping and also crop research. This basically should enable, we hope that this enable uh, new ways of working in, uh, you know, in the national, in um, having a national infrastructure. So it's very, it's very general what we do. So then I, I tell briefly what we do in general and what I do for Film UK. So basically, Imagine that you want to use the, I don't know, the CT scans we have here in Nottingham. So now if you want to do it, you need to call them, you need to have an agreement, you need to move, it's, it's a process. So we want to facilitate the access to facilities. And particularly what I do is to have the, I cover with sort of from the University of Edinburgh, the data research infrastructure. So we want to have a way that people can upload the data in a, in a, in a central system. It, it can easily curate them and facilitate sharing uh, basically to all the concept around fair data and, um, and um, also if the time permits at least showcasing the analysis. So when I say if the time permits, because uh, it's a two year project, we are already on our second year, we'll finish ne by next February. Uh, this is just a scoping, pro uh, a scoping project. So we are basically uh, identified the certain gaps with the community. In, for my point of view, for the digital research infrastructure, we talk with uh, many people across the UK, a, a gate, uh, what they do, what they don't do, what they would like to do, what is their operation as of now, we gain some, let's say, quote in quote intelligence, of course, in quote in quote, and uh, try to propose something that can be beneficial in, in the future. Um, if you want to know more about Finim UK, uh, just feel free to ask. All right, I think I, I've taken a lot of your time. Let's uh, wrap it up. Counting is an important, task, an important task in plant phenotyping, but not only, we, it can be done in many ways. For instance, by regression, detection, segmentation. I showed what I've done for regression segmentation. I basically showed also the full story from old fashioned machine learning to the new, you know, gimmick that we have in AI for the transformers, and it can be applied in, uh, in other contexts, biology, you know, for cell counting, or CCTV with pedestrian. Thanks a lot for your attention. And uh, here you see some of my, you know, recent papers. Uh, you can reach out through my email address. I have also a website. I'll, I'll keep this slide for you to read a little bit. Uh, but if you have any questions, I think this is a good time to ask. 
just first want to say thank you um, to Valerio. That's really, really thorough overview of how difficult something as simple to us as counting is for. <laughs> yes. Yeah. Nice overview of different methods for doing it throughout the years. Um, so yeah, just any any questions from anyone? Just feel free to unmute. Let's see if from sharing my screen, I can have. A, oh yes, I can see more people in case some people will unmute themselves. I'll, uh, because I said I want to keep this slide fixed such that people can uh, you know, take note of the email address or or the website. So I guess um, one thing, nice overview of like the past and how leaf counting has been carried out with more traditional techniques and transformers and you know get into the the more NLP esque transformer environment. What do you think the next big thing is? I know it's quite a hard question, but as people who make predictions, what where do you think? What direction? Well, the question. Oh, and I know foundational models you mentioned. Um, Let me ask you another question. The big thing in uh, computer vision in deep learning or in plant uh, or in plant image analysis? Uh, go go plant image analysis. Okay, for me for plant image analysis. Uh, I don't know whether the community is taking that direction. For me, the next big thing will be to run anal uh, analysis from multiple data sets. And this is something that we proposed at the Film UK conference. We asked them, uh, imagine that with Film UK, we managed to have this big data set, and you from James Hutton have your experiment of Arabidopsis done in a, in a specific soil. And uh, I done my experiment on the Arabidopsis on my kind of soil. Can I compare the results somehow? And uh, of course, this might sound, you know, if you have the data from Nottingham or from James Hutton or from Norwich or from whatever, you can easily compare them, right? That's absolutely that you can even do now. However, However, if you can use a large language model behind the scene that basically can also analyze all the metadata, for instance, as I said, I'm not a plant biologist, but I assume that when you run an experiment, you have a lot of metadata, humidity, uh, temperature, uh, water, uh, water content, uh, like uh, from the beginning of the experiment, all this metadata, and can tell me, can you find an experiment that has a similar characteristic of, of with mine and match the result to see if there's variability? I don't think that is easy. Yeah. So I guess it's then understanding and mitigating that domain shift as well. Yes. As incorporating all the metadata. Yeah, that's interesting. Because hopefully with the APGC, um, which you heard from Rob Hancock at the Phenome UK um, open town square type thing. Um, hopefully that's something that we can we can capture a lot of a lot of metadata like the humidity and temperature and um or whatever and, other variable yeah. you might have, right? Like for me saying like uh, okay access to the database I find an experiment that is similar to mine, whatever similar means uh, it's not easy in my opinion. Yeah. Okay. So anyone else, any questions? If not, um, we hold off for a bit. Of course, so feel free to reach out of an email. Eh? Or if you happen to be nothing, I'm just, you know, say it. I know it's far from there, but it's fine. Okay, that, that seems to be it. Just thanks again, Valerio. Um, yeah. Uh, thanks a lot for having me here. Thanks for the invitation. And uh, yeah, I hope you liked it. I see some people clapping. Thanks a lot. <laughs> Excellent.